everybody. That's good. I like audience participation. Um, I, can everybody hear me okay? The mic's working all right? All right, if, I, if you do need me to talk louder, just have at it, and I'll do my best. I'm going to set my timer here because I'm Southern, and I only talk for a couple hours at a shot. Um, but hopefully what we'll talk about tonight uh, is a wide range of things, as was discussed before. And I want it to just be a fun time for everybody. So uh, I, it probably won't work to interrupt me in the middle of the talk to ask questions, but I'll stick around as long as they'll let me uh, after we finish. And uh, I want to talk to you tonight uh, about a variety of different uh, topics having to do with human and robotic planetary field geology through time. But I want to um, start out with my own personal New Year's resolution. Uh, those of you who know anything about NASA these days, and certainly those of you who uh, know about your own economic status these days, uh, there's a lot to worry about, about what's going to happen with NASA, and there's a lot to worry about with our economy, and it's not the cheapest thing in the world to do space exploration. And so there's much hand-wringing in the world about planetary exploration. And uh, my personal New Year's resolution is to take at least one hour a day to just dream and not worry about the economy not worry about what the possibilities are. So I'm going to invite you for the next hour or so to consider planetary exploration from a scientific perspective uh, in a way where I'm not going to worry about how much things cost and whether or not it's feasible. And you can ask me if you want to later about it, and I'll tell you all the dismal details. But on the other hand, we could all just have a good time tonight. So uh, here's the roadmap of my talk. The first thing I want to do is actually not talk specifically about planetary exploration. I want to talk about field science to make sure that everybody uh, is comfortable with that and, and to give you one of my soapbox speeches about the value of doing science in the field. And then we'll talk about human versus robotic exploration, uh, field geology in a sense, in the way that it's practiced on Earth and the way that it's been practiced on the Moon during the Apollo program and the way we might think about doing it in the future in a co more collaborative way involving humans and robots. I'll go into a little bit about where should we explore because this is something that comes up a lot in these kinds of conversations. I'll make the case for a more deliberate approach to that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, how do we prepare for what's to come? And I'll take you to a place that I think we should go intellectually when we think about doing this kind of work, uh, and we'll see what you guys think as well. Hopefully, I'm going to get through all of these things in 45 minutes, so I better get going to do it. So the first thing that I want to talk about a lot is, as Ken pointed out, I, I spent much of my career at MIT. Uh, with a lot of people who were a lot smarter than me. And most of the people there had some very, many people there had some very interesting ideas about the way science is done. If you talk to physicists most of the time, they'll tell you that there is a way that you do science. And if you talk to chemists, there's a way that you do science, and it's usually experimentally based, and it takes place in a laboratory. Uh, but there's another way of doing science, uh, which is a more observational way of doing science, a more discovery-based way of doing science, and a more exploratory way of doing science. And lots of times that gets short shrift. Lots of times people say, well, it doesn't happen in a laboratory. It's not experimentally based. It does not use the scientific method. And so therefore, it's not really science somehow. So I have one existence proof that that is an incorrect statement. So uh, my wife is a professional children's storyteller. So she tells me to tell stories. So I want to tell you stories about somebody, and I'm not going to tell you who this story is about. But it's about a young man who went to college, and this person decided he was going to go to medical school when he went to college. So he goes to medical school, and he gets there, and he finds that it's not really interesting to him at all. This is a quote from this person's autobiography. During my second year at university, I'm not going to tell you where it is yet, I attended lectures on geology and zoology, but they were incredibly dull. I planned never to make my lectures like this, by the way. <laughs> the sole effect they produced on me was the determination never as long as I lived to read a book on geology or in any way to study the science, right? So the guy had had it. Had it to the point that he quit the university. He ended up going to the, another university to do something totally different. He actually went to another university to go to divinity school, okay? He was so unhappy with the way the medical profession was going. And then one of the interesting things that happened is he ran into somebody who persuaded him that, you know, there's another way of looking at science than cutting up cadavers. And one of those ways of doing it is to actually go out and observe things in the field. 
And so he arranged for this person to have an opportunity to go out on a field excursion to do field geology with somebody, and this took place actually in Wales. And so in his autobiography, he writes, on this tour, I had a striking uh, instance of how easy it is to overlook phenomena, however conspicuous, before they've been observed by anyone with a trained eye. In other words, he realized that you could become a well-trained observer, a thoughtful, careful observer, and use the observations that you make of the natural world to be able to say something about the processes that generated what you actually see. And so he taught himself to look closely enough at the natural world that he would do things like make, uh, this is a, a bit of a geologic map. You can see mainly it's a map, even those of you guys in the back can see lines on it, which are actually creeks, rivers going along, and some little colored areas that this person made to try and indicate what the lay of the land and the lay of the rocks were. And so at the time, uh, this person was making a geologic map of that area that he was visiting uh, in northern Wales. And it was really an epiphany for him to be able to go out and make a map like that and learn something out of pure uh, love of enjoyment. And so what happened after that happened was that he got back home after going out in the field, spent a week with this person, out this uh, person who was doing field work out there. And he got back, and as soon as he got back, he found that one of his friends from uh, college had been sufficiently impressed for him that he had been recommended for an opportunity to go on a voyage around the world. And it was a voyage that was going to last, in the end, five years before it was over. And basically, his job on that voyage was to look at the geology in particular, but to look at all of the natural world and understand as much as he could about the geology of the places that he visited. And so what he learned how to do was to make these detail. This is sort of like a cross-section, if you imagine a cross-section through the, through the Earth. And he made these kind of uh, uh, sketches. You can see he was about as good a drawer as I am, uh, which is to say not very good. But later on, when some of these things were published, he had much better drafts people involved. And he made some lovely uh, geologic cross sections like this based on the observations that he made. And then these are some even more dramatic that he was doing in color at that time. And that completely changed his perspective about science, as it turned out. And so one of the things he wrote at that time, this was in a letter to his sister when he was going around the world, there's nothing like geology. The pleasure of the first day's partridge shooting cannot be compared. I literally could hardly sleep at nights for thinking over my observations. And it was pure observation-based science. When he started talking about what effect this had on him and the way he did his work, he became really, I think, quite philosophical about it. He said, the above various special studies were of, however, no importance compared with the habit of energetic industry and concentrated attention to whatever I was engaged in, which I then acquired. Everything about which I thought or read was made to bear directly on what I had seen or was likely to see, and this habit of mind was continued during the five years of the voyage. I feel sure that it was this training, and by that he meant geological training, which has enabled me to do whatever I have done in science. So for those of you who haven't already guessed, this person was Charles Darwin. And Darwin, as you all know, is effectively responsible for evolutionary biology, right? So through the basic theory of evolution by natural selection, which has been referred to by someone, one of his biographers, as one of the most important ideas the human mind has ever produced, and it came from basic observational geology. This was a person who looked at the world around him, who devised ideas. So for those of you who uh, don't appreciate that kind of observational science, remember the next time you have to go uh, think about your own longevity and you think about uh, evolutionary molecular biology and what it impact it's going to have during your lives with effect to your health, thank geology about it. So I'm a big believer in field geology, and I'm a big believer in the value of making the kinds of observations that led Darwin to the point that he could come up with a theory of natural selection uh, in his later years. I mean, basically, the voyage of the Beagle when Darwin went on it as a geologist, effectively made observations during that five years of, of uh, his life, lasted him for the rest of his life. Most of the rest of Darwin's life was a matter of percolating those ideas, getting the, uh, taking the observations that he made when he was on the Beagle, and doing something effective with them, thinking about the way the world worked. 
And so field geology on Earth is an interesting uh, process. And I, I think a lot about that process because, as Ken said, I've been asked to do things like help train people who know nothing about geology, no background in geology, uh, the astronaut, most of the astronauts in particular. How do I get them very quickly thinking like a geologist in the field, making those kinds of observations? So field geology on Earth, a lot of it is about multi-scale observing. I look at things closely and I look at things far away. I get different perspectives on things to try and understand them. The sampling uh, that you do when you get materials, it's a very tactical thing. It actually supports the work that you do. It's not the fundamental thing. I don't go into the field in the Himalaya or someplace like that and pick up stones. I don't wander and pick up stones and bring them back. I go and I make observations in the field and I collect samples that are going to tell me something in the lab, but I collect them very, very carefully when I go. And the other thing about this kind of science is that it's based almost entirely on inductive reasoning. It's not like making an experiment. It's like making observations and trying to cull processes out of those basic experiments, uh, basic observations. So the concepts and strategies are your goal is to constrain the number of plausible geologic histories in a study area. In other words, you're trying to come up with all of the different possibilities that could process possibilities that could explain what you actually see. It involves the development and testing of multiple working hypotheses. So I come up with lots of different ways to explain the observations I make. And the principal product of what I do is to make a geologic map, like Darwin did during the voyages of the Beagle, or a geologic cross-section, which is like a geologic map, just sort of turned on its end. But the other data are collected to validate the interpretations or better constrain the plausible histories. That's basically what we do when we go out uh, into the field. The protocols are we make preliminary interpretations of plausible histories usually these days by using remote sensing data. We use satellite data, we interrogate the satellite data, we understand something about the composition of the rocks from that, but it's a place to start, it's not a place to end. The traverses are planned initially to test preliminary interpretations. In other words, I think this rock type, what I see as a particular color on a remote sensing image, is a particular rock type, but I'm going to have to go over and see what it is. So I plan my traverses in the field to do that. Almost none of them are carried out as you initially plan them. You plan them, you go out into the field, you change your mind, you make observations, and you constantly change what you do when you're in the field. And it's something that's sort of conveniently thought about as flexible ex execution of the traverse plans, or, or something like flexecution if, uh, is the term that we usually use for it. And instead, the traverses evolve as a consequence of observations. They flex we flexecute those traverses that we make, so they're not rule-based in particular. And that's one of the great challenges of figuring out how to do this both robotically and with humans. Field geology on the moon, we've only had one incidence of this, uh, by humans anyway, and that was uh, the Apollo missions. Um, and field geology on the moon was very, very different than the field geology that we do here on Earth. So for one thing, it was an, all about intensive traverse pre-planning. You will walk here, you will make observations there, these are the outcrops you have to stop at and you look at along the way. There was very limited replanning. If you tried as an Apollo astronaut to get out and do something different, you got yelled at because you were not following the script. And there was a huge emphasis on sampling. Bring back the rocks because the scientists are here on Earth and you're not the scientist, right? So um, that's totally unlike what I do when I go into the field. So the concept was that the goal was to improve scientific understanding through data and sample collection for the benefit of scientists on Earth. So you are tools, right? You're human tools. You bring these things back to us and we'll do something clever with them. The traverses in their timelines were carefully choreographed. Most of the flexicution took place at stations. In other words, they go drive to a stop, do something at the stop, and then when they were told to go to the stop and do something, they could take their time and look at things. Well, not their couldn't take their time, but they had a certain amount of time that they could look at things any way they wanted to, but they couldn't change the way they traversed. Um, the methods were otherwise pretty derivative of conventional field geology, and there was very low uh, reliance on high technology during the lunar explorations. It's hard to imagine, but basically the tools that they had were like, here's a hammer, here's a rake, here's a scoop. That's basically all you could really do. There was no technology really working for you. Well, the other way we've tried to do field geology is robotically on places like Mars. In particular, those are the ones that you're most familiar with, with the uh, 
the Mars Exploration Rovers, the little MER rovers, and you know that there's been a new launch of a new, the next new great uh, robot that's going to Mars called the Mars Science Laboratory that's now in space on its way to Mars and it'll land next August. But the idea about this, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about the Mars Exploration Rovers, one of which is still operational on the surface of Mars, and then in this case, there was virtually no traverse pre-planning. The reason for that is that the way that it landed on Mars, for those of you who remember when it landed on Mars, it came down and it was encased in sort of inflatable bubble. And it fell out of the sky in Mars, it hit the ground, it bounced, it rolled, and then the thing deflated and then the rover fell out of it and moved on from there. So they couldn't exactly tell where it was going to land. And if you can't exactly tell where it was going to land, well, you sure, certainly can't pre-plan your traverses very well, right? So they had a, a landing ellipse, they call it, an area where it might land that was many tens of kilometers, and they knew that it wasn't really going to go that far because it didn't have the mechanical capability to go that far. So ironically, there's a lot of flexicution with the Mars rovers. In fact, it's much more like the field geology than I do than the field geology that was done during the Apollo program in particular. And most of the data, because there are no humans there, is done remotely. So they collect data and then they ship it back um, to Earth um, through uh, transmission. So the goal here is to improve scientific understanding of the evolution of Mars through remote data collection on Mars by scientists on Earth. So sometimes you'll hear a comment which drives me bananas, people saying, we have these robotic field geologists working on Mars. Well, you really don't. What you have is tools working on Mars, and the field geologists are on Earth operating those tools, right? So you're teleoperating uh, tele those particular instruments from a long way away. The traverses are made up entirely on the fly, just like when I go out in the field and I say, hey, what's that interesting rock over there? And I go look at something. It's the same sort of thing with uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers. The tempo of exploration is constrained by the technology. In other words, I can't drive my, you know, the Mars rovers have not actually gone very far in the last few years, and the reason is that they have to be very deliberate about where they go, because no one wants to, you know, if those of you who do four-wheeling, no one wants to high center one of the rovers on a rock and ruin the program with it. So everything is done very carefully and very deliberately and very, very slowly. Those robots actually can move much faster than they do move on the surface of Mars. And the reason is simply that they have to be careful, and that constrains the tempo of the exploration. So far, the MER rovers have been up, I believe it's seven years now. And the total amount of, of uh, ground that's been traversed by both the rovers, um, Spirit and Opportunity, is less than the amount of ground that was traversed during three days in the Apollo 17 mission. Okay? So it's a very, very slow process. But there's a very high reliance on high technologies. These things, and especially the Mars Science Laboratory, are bristling with scientific instruments. So it's a different kind of world. So what we'd like to look forward to is something that's really beyond that, this sort of advanced planetary field geology, if you want to call it that. And it's one that involves the coordination of human and robotic operations. So, for example, instead of just sending humans there with very low technology to the surface of a planet, what if we were to send humans to the surface of a planet in a way that they could have wearable computing on them so that they could have enhanced sensory capabilities than what humans actually have? What if we had robotic field assistants that could work with them? Uh, that I could say, I will deploy this set of robots around a landscape to augment what I can see, to give me those different perspectives so that I can make more efficient and better geologic maps, better observations. I have observational partners out in the field. What if, before I went to an area to do planetary field geology, I could send what are called precursor robots. I could send robots to the surface of a planet, and they could do the groundwork, they could find the more interesting things, they could be teleoperated from somewhere, Earth or somewhere else, as we'll see in a minute. And that information could be used to do the pre-planning of the traverses that I do when I get onto a planetary surface. And then finally, uh, we can't stay on a planetary surface very long for a lot of reasons. We run out of resources, you know, we run out of air, we don't have enough to eat, we run out of uh, basic life support systems. And so we can only stay a short amount of time. Well, robots, if you can 
lick the energy problem, if you can figure out a way to make them operate uh, using uh, energy systems that will last for a very long time, they can stay there a lot longer than humans can. So you can imagine that I can come up with a set of tasks that I wasn't able to complete. So I could do follow-up robotics on the surface of a planet somehow and augment the geologic observations I make in that regard. So there's a lot of things that we could do if we incorporate robots into that process. And that's one of the, I think, the next great frontiers with planetary surface operations. How do you make it more efficient? How do you make it less dangerous? How do you make it uh, more effective in terms of uh, science return? So that kind of coordination is fantastic. And the thing I really love about it is that it's much more like discovery-based science than the, than the Apollo uh, field expeditions were. It gives you an opportunity to go out, to make observations, to change the way you make observations, and to flexicute these traverses through time. So that's where we're going conceptually right now uh, with these next stages of, uh, of planetary field geology. So some of the concepts and protocols, the goal in this case is to improve scientific understanding of exploration targets through both robotic and human data collection. So we're actually trying to do more of the science on the surface of the planet than bringing back samples for humans to look at here on Earth. Not that we wouldn't do that because we have better analytical capabilities here on Earth, but we would triage those samples. We'd say these are the right samples to bring back, not just any old sample that we grab and we bring back. That means that we should be able to do something like near autonomous science on a planetary surface. So in other words, rather than sending the Apollo astronauts up almost like tools to the moon to be able to do geology, what if we send people who are highly trained and highly capable to the surface of the moon or anywhere else to be able to do this kind of work? The technology should extend and enhance, not inhibit and diminish astronaut activities. This is an important thing. I do a lot of training of, of my own students and training of people like astronauts, and we use fairly high technology. We use pads, we use daylight readable computing, we allow them to do things out in the field, but many times that actually hinders the process. It slows them down because the interfaces with those tools are much slower than writing something down on a piece of paper or taking a picture or just making an observation. And the primary emphasis should be on observation and analysis, not on sample collection, because if all you do is focus on collecting samples, you'll spend a huge amount of time when you may not need to do it. Now, one of the things I want to switch over to now uh, really has to do with one of the concerns that we have in America right now, and that's where are our next exploration targets going to be? And there was a, a, a study that was commissioned um, actually by, by the White House not many years ago that was called the Augustine Commission uh, Report. And they did a report on how to think about human space exploration going into the future over the next few years. And basically there had been a pre-existing plan to go back to the surface of the moon uh, that was uh, misfiring a lot. It was not getting done very quickly. And so the idea was let's rethink this whole thing and come up with an idea. And so the basic idea that came, they came up with was not to have a specific destination. And the idea was to say, well, we don't know what we're going to do, but let's think about this flexibly. Like, how can we come up with a plan for space exploration that would permit a return to the moon, if we decide that's what we want to do, or allow us to explore asteroids, to actually go to asteroids, to explore Martian moons and eventually Mars itself someday down the road, to prepare for deep space outposts. There are many who believe that the most important <coughs> things to get into deep space, to get into near uh, Earth or what's called low Earth orbit. <coughs> or do we just want to keep all of our options open? Do we want to have a space program that is uh, so ill-defined, and I mean that phrase charitably actually, uh, so ill-defined that we have lots of options as we go forward? And this infuriates some people, right? It's like, oh, where's my destination? I don't know where I'm going to go. And I have to say that, that I've come to be um, pretty persuaded that it's not the worst idea in the world to think about things like that. And here's why. Really, there are not that many places we can go right now with the technologies that we have and with the technologies that we can imagine for the next 100 years or so. So this is our neck of the woods. Uh, this is our solar system. And these are really the places that we could explore. Probably not the sun for pretty obvious reasons. 
But, uh, but basically the options that we have are the planets from Mercury on out, the so-called dwarf planets, including Pluto at this point, and a few extra ones that are way out there, and we have lots of asteroids that are implied by this one here, Sirius, which is the biggest of these asteroids. And let me give you a quick tour, for those of you who don't know much about planetary science, why you might go to any of these places. Well, the first one is the moon. The moon's pretty obvious. The interesting thing about the moon, we have been there, but the interesting thing about the moon is that the moon is a dead rock compared to Earth. Earth is a very vibrant, very dynamic place. We have plate tectonics on this planet that's constantly resurfacing our planet. The moon is very different. There was never plate tectonics on the moon. In fact, as far as we know, there's no plate tectonics on any other planet in the solar system. And so as a consequence of that, the moon was created, uh, formed, about four billion years ago. We'll just leave it at that, not go into decimal points. So it was formed about four billion years ago, and basically what's happened is it's been pounded by meteorites for the last four billion years, because there's no atmosphere to stop them for them to burn up in. And so it's been pounded by those meteorites, and as a consequence of that, the moon is like an archive of what Earth was like four billion years ago. So we can go to the moon and we can study literally what Earth was like at that time. We can study its impact, its meteoritic impact history much better than we can do on Earth because most of that record has been destroyed by plate tectonics. So it's a fantastic place to learn the history of our planet. So we go to the moon, sure, to study the science of the moon, to study the evolution of the moon, but that tells us a lot about the evolution of this planet in its very early stages. So it's a good place to work. It's a difficult place to work there. There are wildly variable temperatures, minus 400 degrees, I'll use Fahrenheit just to make it easy, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit to about 260 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. So there's some technological challenges to working on the moon. Now some people say we should not go to the moon for the one simple reason that we've been to the moon, right? So I want, you to, I want to invite you to think about that for a second. Um, so here's a list of the top six tourist destinations in Florida. <laughs> We've been to the moon six times, okay? Apollo 11, 12, we all know 13 was a bust, 14, 15, 16, 17, right? We've been there six times. Saying that you understand even a rock like the moon of that size after six visits is patently absurd if you're a scientist. Uh, and in this case, I think you would argue that if you see these six places, you have not seen all of Florida, right? Uh, we, and the moon is a much bigger place than Florida. So asteroids is another possibility. You could go look at asteroids. Uh, the interesting thing about asteroids is that they also give you uh, a lot of information about the early history of the solar system in particular. They're difficult to work on because they're low gravity objects. You can't really land easily on an asteroid, right? Because there's very little gravity because the bodies are so small. It's about minus 100 Fahrenheit or something like that. But one of the reasons that they might be interested to go to is that the so-called near-Earth asteroids, the one that come close to our orbit in the solar system, could potentially hit uh, Earth and could potentially do devastating things like the uh, meteorite that's thought to have uh, essentially precipitated the end of the dinosaurs um, so many hundred millions of years ago, or 60 million, tens of millions of years ago. Um, Mars, everybody, lots of people like the idea of going to Mars. Mars is a much more dynamic place than the moon, not as dynamic as Earth, but it has polar ice caps. There's increasing evidence that Mars had liquid water on the surface sometime in its history. An intriguing question is, why isn't it there now? Right? What went with it? What happened to it? And when we ask questions like that, we're actually asking questions about our own planet, right? We live on a very fragile place with a very fragile, thin atmosphere and a very fragile, thin hydrosphere. And so if we want to understand how to effectively protect what we've got, because we like Earth the way it is, I think. And so if we want to protect it somehow, we could do with some planet, with some sort of comparative planetology to try and understand better uh, what the evolution of these other places like Mars might be. It's an okay place to visit. Actually, the temperature ranges are not as extreme as they are on the moon because they're moderated by the atmosphere on Mars. So it's a pretty interesting place. 
There are moons around Mars, like Phobos and Deimos, that are easier to get to even than Mars because of the lack of atmosphere. They may tell us some interesting information, but also they may tell us a lot about asteroids because they're probably captured asteroids, Phobos and Deimos. Then there's Venus. Everybody really is interested in Venus. Venus has this inf incredible atmosphere. It's not a nice atmosphere. It's a CO2-rich atmosphere with sulfuric acid clouds in it. That's a lovely place to be. Um, it has a very young active surface constantly forming and reforming, but it's an awfully hard place to work. The temperatures are really high. Uh, the atmospheric pressure is 90 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Um, so technologically, it's a very difficult place to go. And then, of course, there's Mercury in the inner solar system. It has a surface that actually looks much like the moon, has essentially no atmosphere, but again, radical variations in temperature from minus 275 to 850 Fahrenheit on the surface of the mercury. So a lot of these places are very different, difficult to get to, and the ones out here are just plain too far away to get to. So really when we talk about human planetary exploration, our options are Mars, the Moon, the asteroid belt. That's it, pretty much, unless we want to go someplace else. Uh, out into deep space but not go to a particular destination. Now one of the particular destinations that's become really popular these days, and it's really popular, I like this idea, I'm, I'm warming up to it. I used to not like it at all, but I'm warming up to it, are these places that are called Lagrange points. Now for those of you who don't know what they are, a, a sort of a simple explanation is this. Um, imagine that, and we're going to talk about Lagrange points around the Earth-Moon system. So imagine a situation, this represents the Sun in the middle of the system. Here's Earth, here's the Moon. And as we all know, the Moon orbits Earth. Both of them together orbit the Sun, eventually. Well, the interesting thing is that when you have an orbital system like this, where things are moving constantly, there are a handful of places, really five places, that you could imagine being within the system, not on the surface of any of these uh, particular bodies, but five places that you can imagine to be where if you're there, you're basically in a stable position with respect to Earth and the Moon in this case. In other words, you are static. From your perspective, Earth and the Moon remain the same under those circumstances. And so these are the points, there are five of them, like I said. These are the points, L4, L5, 3, 2, and 1. And the interesting thing about these is that they're very useful places, potentially useful places to park things out in space because you really can't park them out in space in those places. They don't fly off uh, somewhere else in the solar system. And the interesting, and two of them I want to really focus on here, these are L1 and L2. So L1 is an interesting place because it's relatively close to Earth, but it's between Earth and the Sun most of the time. So basically what happens is that you're sitting there and you have the Sun in your eyes or at your back most of the time, and it makes it difficult to make some sort of key observations, but it's a pretty easy place to go to. The other one is L2 that sits out a farther distance away from Earth than the Moon, but it does a couple of really interesting things. It gives you a stable connection to Earth, but it also gives you a stable connection to the far side of the moon. And, the, and if you look back and you think about, look at a map of all of the Apollo missions that have gone to the moon, they're all on the near side of the moon, right? We've never explored the far side of the moon. One of the big problems is we've had no direct communication links from the far side of the moon to Earth. It's really line of sight communication, right? So you can't communicate easily if you put people or robots or anything else on the far side of the moon. But L2 is an interesting place because it has a direct view of the far side of the moon and a direct line of sight to Earth. So you basically are in a situation where you can maintain near continuous communication links with both of them from L2 by comparison. And as a consequence of that, this is a place where lots of people are interested these days in parking assets that would allow you to look out into deep space. This is meant to represent the James Webb Space Telescope that some of you might have heard of uh, that they're hoping to launch as sort of the next big successor to the Hubble Space Telescope in the future. And the idea is that for, for it to look out into deep space. But the interesting thing is that if I'm here, this is a fantastic place to look back on Earth to get whole Earth views, and a fantastic place to study the far side of the moon. And the thing that I'm particularly interested in right now 
is it's a fantastic place to sit in a space station and operate instruments on the lunar surface. So for example, you can imagine, just as we have an International Space Station now, you're sitting at, a Lagrange, at L2, this Lagrange point 2, and I would be able to have direct line of communication so that I could teleoperate robots like the Mars Science Laboratory or the MER rovers directly on the surface of the far side of the moon from that particular position. The other interesting thing about that is that the teleoperation from that distance is very short. In other words, the amount of time it takes for a signal to go to the surface of the moon and back to you from that position is short enough that you really don't sense the distinction. It's, it's within something that we can think of as sort of the cognitive window. There's a delay in the communication, but it's such a short delay in communication that your brain doesn't pick it up, okay? Um, and so as a consequence of that, there is a possibility of actually doing telepresence with robotics. If we get much better robots than we have right now, to literally put your avatar on the surface of the moon, on the far side of the moon, and allow me to be a field geologist on the far side of the moon, but actually be at L2 in a space station, right? So if I could do something like download my cognition to the surface of the moon, to a robotic asset on the surface of the moon, or multiple robotic assets on the surface of the moon, I can do field geology just like I do now, and just like Darwin did, but I can do it from a space station, okay? And that's, I think, the next great um, opportunity we have in the future, to start imagining this kind of telescience. So my personal interest, and I am not a robotics person, but I'm working with lots of smart robotics people, like the people who work here, is to try and, and push forward the notion of being able to do science without being there. Okay? We don't do that yet on Mars, really. We don't, we've never done that on the moon. We've never done it anywhere else. But that's one of the things I'm imagining uh, for the future. So that's, that's it for my presentation today. And I'm happy to take questions and talk about other things, and you can stretch me out as much as you want to. But thanks very much for coming, and thanks to IHMC. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. You, can, I, can I make the calls here? Please, go ahead. Are you a kind man? No. <laughs> L2, does it have a distance to be out, or is it a range, or it has to be a certain distance? It has to be on that line, but does it make L2, any difference? L2 is a space, is a place, yeah. but uh, one of the things I didn't go into in detail, but since you're an unkind man, I'll go into it. No, uh, L2 is, of these Lagrange points, a couple of those Lagrange points, actually four and five, are quite stable, all right? In other words, I go there and I'm parked there. Um, L1 and L2 are a little different, and L2 is an example of this. Um, you will drift from L2, but you drift a little bit, and you can go into what's called a, a, a halo orbit around L2. So it's an, a fairly eccentric orbit, but it takes very little energy to maintain that orbit, to maintain that position. So you do have to do positioning work to stay there, but it's very minimal positioning work. One of the interesting things, too, is um, about the, the transition from L1 to L2 uh, it takes very little energy. So in other words, once you're at L2, it doesn't take a lot of energy to get you to L1. And once you're at L1, it doesn't take a lot of energy to get you back to L2. It takes way more energy to get to L1 or L2 from Earth than it does to get back and forth between the two. Uh, it takes less energy uh, to get to L2 than it does to get to L1. Yes. I know you said you don't do robotics. You have I don't other people do doing, robotics. Yeah. <laughs> However, but since I do we're, stay in a holiday. So, no, there you go. <laughs> since we're not going to limit our choices of where we're going to explore, yeah. let's let's go to Venus. Okay. Do we use robots that have been pressurized for the Laurentian Trench on Earth? You use robots that are beyond the imagination of people who do robotics right now on Earth. Um, and the reason is simply that the temperature extremes are so high, it's not that I can't make a material, you know, but it's that I can't keep it operational. 
right? I mean, you ever, you ever leave your uh, something out in the sun too long and it doesn't work very well, or it's, it's getting really seat. cold outside. It's called car seat. Yeah, that, that exactly. So you know, the problem is getting these sophisticated electronics to work under those conditions. And I, I didn't even talk about um, issues like radiation, right? Which are also big issues, um, but uh, and particularly for a place like Venus. So yeah, there are a lot of people who would love to go to Venus, but it's hard to imagine, I mean, we've had a hard time even imagining landers that can last very long, uh, let alone something that we'd like to deploy and allow to work for a considerable amount of time. Like, like you know, I said, I, I love to imagine, and, and I, don't, I don't imagine that it's impossible, but I imagine that it's not within our technological capacity right now. Yes? This may be a little off the subject. It's okay. <coughs> I understand that. I'm easy with that. Magnetic fields have a lot to do with missile technology, particularly mm -hmm. targeting. Yep. I've uh, been reading lately that there may be a flip-flop in the magnetic field in our country, or in the world, rather. Yep. And what effect, if any, is that going to have on us? Uh, well, <coughs> here's something to think about. Um, the the <coughs> magnetic fields on Earth have reversed many times over the history of Earth. We know it happens. Right. Um, of course, the question that we care about is, is it happening now or will it happen soon? The problem is that the change in magnetic fields is a pretty chaotic process. And I mean that word scientifically, if you understand what I'm saying. Chaotic in the sense that it's unpredictable, predictably unpredictable as to when it's going to happen. So when people tell you that uh, right around the corner there's going to be a flop in the magnetic field, it's really hard to justify that argument. It's not necessarily wrong, of course, because that's, it's the nature of a chaotic system. It could happen while I'm talking tonight. But that doesn't mean that, um, that it's going to happen necessarily. It's a very hard thing to predict. Now, if it did happen, the question is, how fast would it happen? And what would be the impact if it happened that quickly? You know? And so now, I think one of the things that we don't know about this planet is how long a magnetic reversal takes, right? Or does, do they all take the same amount of time? Is it just like that? Does it take a million years? Um, that's a difficult thing to get at. And the reason that we have a hard time getting at it is that the precision of the ways that we measure time back in the history of Earth are much lower than the precision with which I measure whether or not I'm talking too long tonight, right? So as a consequence of that, the errors are such that I can't tell the difference between, you know, 100,000 years ago and 95,000 years ago. And so for you and me, it could take 5,000 years or it could happen like that. We just don't know. We don't know and we can't tell. But the effects would be profound, right? I mean, our, our compasses would work differently. Our pigeons would work differently. Um, no, I mean, it, it would be a profound effect, but it has happened many times, and I think we can guarantee it will happen again. We just don't know when. Anyone else? Any more questions? Oh, my gosh. Two, one, two. You first, then you. Okay. Please. Um, I'm a really big fan of science fiction, and science fiction tends to pre predict science. I mean, Arthur Clarke developed the communication satellite, and so you read science fiction and have been reading for years about being able to download your brain into a robot. Yeah. And I'm hearing about this. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that something really <laughs> interesting? I'm okay, yes, to, you're pushing I'm, me, I'm, okay? I'm, well, I'm planning to do this. You're so pushing I need me to into a realm of things I don't really know. But I, but, but I think the idea, so, so here's the difficult thing. Here's the problem from my perspective about this. Um, I've worked with a lot of mobile robots in the field that have been made by very smart people. And the problem is that robots are really do, good at doing rule-based things, you know, go there, do that, that sort of thing. They're really good at it. Um, we have been working toward the promise of thinking machines, real thinking machines, for as long as I've been sentient, okay? And we're making progress, no doubt, but um, we're still a long way from creating something that works as well as that microprocessor megaprocessor, macroprocessor uh, up there. And so as a consequence of that, it seems smarter to me to, to imagine putting myself in that kind of a situation than it is to work 
the really hard work of making a sentient, well, sentient may be the wrong <coughs> word, but making an int truly intelligent robot like that. So you could think, you could imagine these things in lots of different ways, but I, I, I feel that uh, the only difficulty that I have right now is that if my visual acuity, if the sensors will give me feedback, if my eyes will be able to see things, and the delay between when I see something, when, some, when I see it and when it actually happened is so short that my brain can't tell the difference, I'm effectively there. So I'm not sort of downloading my brain, I'm downloading my cognition, my way of seeing things and knowing things and doing things. But what it requires is that we reduce the cognitive load associated with running the robot to zero so that I don't even know it's there. I mean, you know, most of us when we drive a car, I've been driving a car many, many years, and, and after a while I almost don't know the car's there. Right? It's me. I'm going to go to the store. I don't say, I'm going to get in my car and drive it to the store. And so to me, that we're not that far. We, c we can imagine this possibility to be able to do that. And so that's, that's what I would like Thank to imagine. You. You're welcome. And now your question back. Thank you. Uh, the Chinese are going to the, uh, the moon here in the near future. And is there anything we're sharing with them or we expect them to share with us on that trip? Or? No. I don't, I don't make that decision. I, I don't make that decision. I mean, I, I'm actually personally, I'm being a little bit flippant, but I, I'm, I'm personally a believer that um, in this day, and I, t I said I wasn't going to talk about economies, but, um, but in this day and age, I'm personally a believer that space exploration is something that we should do as a, as a society, right? And I'm a believer that we should work on these things together, but the fact of the matter is um, there are a lot of enemies, pseudo-enemies, and just plain people that you're suspicious of uh, in, on this planet. And so countries tend to guard their um, secrets and their capabilities very, very carefully. Um, we don't want to give away all of our secrets to uh, all of our knowledge to the Chinese. We want, them, we want to challenge them to discover this stuff for themselves. Um, but at the same time, I will tell you that the Chinese are far more closed about this than we are. Uh, we work very effectively with the European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, all these sorts of things. Russians, yeah, we depend on the Russians now to get to low Earth orbit. And, and so we, we do work with other countries. The Chinese are very, very closed about this. And one of the things to remember is that in China, the space program is in the military, right? So there's not a civilian space agency in China. I have friends who want to do planetary science and get involved with space exploration in China, but they're in the universities. So they have to come to me and try to create collaborative uh, opportunities with me here because they can't get connected with the space program in China because they're not in the military. So I do believe that my answer was correct. I mean, I like it, but I think it's correct. We have time for one more question. And yet, there's so many. I'll stick around. You can come ask me specifically, but let's let you go first since the mic is close. And in the back, come see me. We'll talk. Uh, when, I <coughs> Excuse me. when I was a graduate student, uh, the Apollo program was canceled. Um, with current budget issues in the United States, <laughs> as well as the, the, the I opened the door. I used that word economy, didn't I? So. <laughs> no, I, I'm curious to... Uh, your view on where the whole space program is really going. Oh, boy. Uh, Ken, can I give you that one? You can just, yeah. no. <laughs> I, um, okay, so I'm going to say, I, I hate to end things with a down note. Can I answer one more question after this? Yeah, one more. So, so. Yeah. So here's, here's my down belief, right? I, I have graduate students who believe that with all their heart that the one thing they want to do is go to another planetary surface, right? I mean, that's what they, and that, you know, these people are 22 years old, 20, 21, 22 years old. Um, I think it's plausible they might, okay? I think it's not going to happen in my lifetime or your lifetime that we're going to go to another planetary surface. I just don't think so. Um, I do think, however, that an idea like that might happen. 
Okay? I think that's plausible. It's possible. I do think we're going to go out into deep space. Right? I do believe that's the case. Whether or not we're going to do it in the next decade, two decades, three decades, I'm not so sure. And, of course, a lot of my scientific colleagues, I don't agree with this, but a lot of my scientific colleagues would say that's just hunky-dory because we should be doing space exploration robotically anyway. You know, most of the science community back during Apollo thought Apollo was a bad idea. They thought that it would be much better if we spent all that money on robotics, even then, back in the 60s. So, uh, so there's my downer, and this better be a good question. So tell me your last question. <laughs> That was a good question, but it's just a, it's a downer, you know? And I think we've run out of alcohol, so. <laughs> Go to your place and drink our sorrows, right? Okay, okay. It was the you same. have no question? That was my question. Oh, God. Somebody else come up with a better one. Okay, so. With the Kepler satellite. Kepler, yes. Kepler, going out and discovering all these planets. Yes. Far more numerous than there are stars. Are you involved with trying to determine the geology of those planets? Um, I would like to be, but I, I think, you know, exoplanets, which is what you're talking about, for those of you who don't know, these are planets that are outside our solar system. That's why they're called exoplanets. And um, that's one of the hottest fields in astronomy and astro... Well, I wouldn't say astrophysics, in astronomy right now. The reason it's one of the hottest fields in astronomy is that we can barely see them. It's been less than five years since we've actually directly with a telescope observed an exoplanet, right? All the rest of them have been discovered, like you say, but they're discovered by inference based on the dimming of the light of the star as a planet passes in front of it, right? So you, you well, that's the main art. That's a simplistic, but, you know, trust me, it's something like that. And, uh, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to bore you. We, like I said, we don't have enough alcohol. So, um, but, but basically, uh, we're just now to the point that we're directly observing planets, okay? It's literally, I think 2007 was the first paper published on it. And so, we can barely see them. They're points of light. And now we have sensors that are good enough that we can actually take detailed spectra of the reflected light that's coming off from some of the, not detailed, but it's like one pixel if you're taking a picture, right? It's like one pixel. And so from that, we can say something about the composition of the atmosphere and or the solid part of the body. Most of the exoplanets that we can see are like Jupiter, like they're big gas giant type things, right? So rocky planets like Earth, which is what everybody wants to look for, super Earths, they're called, the bigger ones that you can actually detect. Uh, most of those, all we can say is that the general composition is this. That's all we can really say, okay? So uh, we're a long, 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 long way from being able to do geology on one of those places because we can't see enough detail. Is that an okay answer? It's very cool that they're out there. You know, I, I, there was a, a new uh, a theoretical study just came out the other day that I thought was just a hoot. You know, there are a lot of people who are making their entire careers on cataloging these planets, right? You say it's like every day, especially Kepler has really revolutionized this. Kepler is a big uh, orbital uh, asset telescope, effect effectively, in space. And, and Kepler uh, has gotten to the point that now every day we're discovering new planets. But there was a theoretical study that was just published a couple of days ago, and uh, they demonstrated, based on simple theoretical concepts, that every star has planets, okay? So, in a way, it kind of puts all these guys out of business when you think about it. You know, they're so happy when they discover a new planet. And if the argument is that every solar system, every, every sun has a solar system, uh, then that sort of goes away. And it's not, why is that so surprising? I find it very amazing that people just assume that they're not there. It's just that our technology has just now gotten to the point where we can see them. Okay. On that note, let's At least that's hopeful. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.